Have you ever wondered why most of the bananas you see in the store look and taste exactly the same? Well, that's because for the most part, they are the same banana. Most of the bananas that are in the international trade route are the same variety called the Cavendish variety. These bananas have been bred over the year because they are pretty disease resistant. They travel well, they stay green, they have a good shelf stable life. And for the most part, they've been pretty good. Although you may have heard recently, there's an issue with the Cavendish banana. In Colombia, we found that the Cavendish is actually susceptible to a new strain of the Panama disease that, that causes banana wilt. And it was actually a pretty extreme situation down in Colombia where people were wondering, are we even going to have bananas? Is this going to wipe out our complete banana crop? Because over the years, this is basically the only banana variety that we import and export. So it could be a real problem. In this video, we're going to talk about issues of biodiversity, and I'm going to tell you what happens to the Cavendish banana. Let's get started. So, how do we characterize a community? We look at the structure of the community. One, we look at the diversity within the species of that community. In other words, how many different species are there in a particular community? So, right here you see in this community, a lot of different fungi, right? Quite a bit of fungal diversity. So this is a very diverse community. We can also characterize a species by its composition, meaning what is it mostly composed of? For this community down here, a typical wheat field in the US, you can see there is a dominant species, wheat. And that is the species that has the highest biomass, right? Or mass of life. The most massive living thing in this picture, in this field, is wheat. So we can characterize a community by how diverse it is. We see a lot of diversity there. We can also characterize it by its dominant species or its composition. Here, we see one really dominant species there. We also need to consider something called a keystone species when we are characterizing a community. And in this video, we're going to go through all these ideas, diversity, composition, and keystone species. Keystone species, as I suggested, play a key role in the community. And we're going to really look at the key role that sea stars play in a marine community because they have a strong effect on the composition of that community. So let's start by talking about species diversity. What we know is that in ecology, greater diversity equals greater stability. So the more diverse a population is, the more stable that community is. So take, for example, community A versus community B. If you look, there's roughly the same number of trees in community A and community B. But in community A, you can see that there's clearly more diversity, right? In B, I see this type of tree and I see this type of tree. That's really all the diversity there is. But up here in community A, we got that type and 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 that type. So community A, we would say, is a lot more diverse Thus, it is a lot more stable. So why do we care about this? Well, greater biodiversity offers, one, more food resources. If different species are there, they will be competing perhaps for different resources. That also means there's more habitats. If you have particular animals, let's say, living in this community, there's a diversity in habitats that can they can occupy. And then... They're also more resilient in the face of an environmental change. So like the bananas we were speaking about earlier, if there was some disease that came along, this community is more likely to survive than this community because this community has less 
diversity. So some disease might wipe out that community, whereas this, because there's greater stability, is more likely to survive. So let's talk about the impact that this biodiversity has. So um, a few years ago when I was um, in Spain, I took this picture and I thought this, this really represents a really nice natural area, right? This has not been um, particularly landscaped, right? It's just different species. And you may remember from the previous video, there's grasses and trees and maybe a climax forest community. So there's a lot of biodiversity in this natural area. Now, take another example that's the opposite of a natural area. That's one that we groomed, agriculture, for example, a monoculture. This is a monoculture, I think mono one. So it's a culture of just one crop. Now, of course, in the United States, we see a lot of these in our fields and all other places around the world. But there, while this is important for feeding us, there's actually another issue that could arise by these monocultures. Um, a really important thing we learned about monocultures was something that happened in 1970 when the U.S. corn crop failed. In fact, during that time, we lost about a fourth of the entire corn crop. And you might say, ah, who cares? We don't, we don't necessarily need the corn. But think about everything corn is in, right? Corn meal, corn chips, there's so, popcorn. We all love popcorn. So there's so many things um, that we use corn for. And when we wipe out a quarter of the corn crop, that's a big issue. Well, what happened back in 1970? Well, just like the bananas, we had developed a hybrid strain of corn, which did pretty well. But something happened, and we found out that it was not resistant to leaf blight fungus. And this fungus took out a quarter of the corn crop. And because most of the corn was this monoculture, this one single variety, a lot of it was wiped out. So these monocultures can be very dangerous because they lack diversity. So I said I'd finish the story of the banana. I actually took these banana, these banana pictures, let me flex for a minute, when I was in the islands in the French Polynesia on the island of Morea. And this was right outside um, of my room and I just thought it was amazing. If you haven't ever seen bananas growing, it's pretty cool how they grow. So what happened to the Cavendish banana crop? Well, there's actually, um, there was a little bit of a rebound. We are starting to look at some different varieties. There's some new strains that are in development that we're trying to push out, but we are still at risk of losing a large variety of, or a large amount of our banana supply if we don't um, start really diversifying some of the species that we use. So we right now can still get bananas. You can still get them in the store. Um, but scientists are working to develop and create strains that are more resistant to that particular disease. So for right now, you can still get your bananas, but uh, we need to be careful and continue to watch it. All right, so the last thing I talked about um, early on was that we can rate and characterize a community by these things called keystone species. What is a keystone species? Well, it's basically a species in a community that has an influential ecological role, right? It's not necessarily always the apex predator, could be, but it's one instead that has a really important role because it regulates other species in the community. And we find that these keystone species increase the diversity in the habitat. So let me go back to my original example that I mentioned. That's the sea star, Pisaster ochraceus. And the sea star um, was studied in a particular study on the coast of Washington state. And what was found, they did some studies over several years. The sea star is actually a keystone species because it helps regulate mussels. This is the California mussel, Mytilus Califor californianus. And this mussel population can really get out of control if the sea stars aren't there to eat it and keep it under control. So if the sea star is absent, 
the mussels are able to outcompete all other species and they quickly take over. Look at all these mussels and how quickly they've taken over this particular area. So the sea star, no one would really consider that an apex predator, but it's an important species in its ecological niche because it keeps this mussel population under control. So let me give you another example here of keystone species, and that is the sea otter. So in the North Pacific, the keystone predator is the sea otter. So if you think about it, right, there's all of these kelp forests in the ocean and in the water, and this kelp would be eaten a lot by sea urchins. Sea urchins love to feed on this kelp. Well, if it weren't for the sea otters keeping the sea urchin population in control, the sea urchin population would drastically increase eating all this kelp, completely changing the particular community ecosystem. So the sea otter actually is what we consider to be a keystone species because it keeps the sea urchins under control so that the kelp is still available for other species within that community. The jaguar, also a keystone species in its particular niche and ecosystem. The interesting thing about the jaguar is that it's also an umbrella and apex species as well. Apex, you kind of understand, right? It's at the apex, it's at the top. It's sort of that apex predator. But it's also an umbrella species because we found is when we try to protect the jaguar, it's like an umbrella, right? I'm trying to draw one. I'm not very good. I don't know that, uh, at the drawing. But when we protect it, it's actually protecting a lot of the other species that are endangered below it. So it's, we consider this an umbrella species, a keystone species, and an apex predator as well. And then one of, one of I think, the most interesting keystone species is what you see here. Can anybody guess what this species is going to be? You can kind of look and see what's going on there. Um, this is actually the beaver. The beaver, oh, there it comes, is a keystone species in the northeast and west. And you can probably guess why right? Because they build these dams, essentially creating different habitat, one there and one there. So their ability to change the landscape, to change the ecosystem, make them a keystone species. Okay, so you've had several examples I've given you of keystone species. You've got the sea star, the sea otter, the jaguar, and the beaver. So we can actually calculate diversity of a community by using what we call Simpson's Diversity Index. And here's the fancy formula, okay? So basically what we're saying is the diversity index is one minus the sum of n over big N squared. So it's the sum of these things squared. So for example, n is the total number of organisms of a particular species, capital N, is the total number of organisms of all species in that community. So let's try to do a quick little example problem of this. So remember our two communities, community A and community B. Let's start by calculating the diversity index of community A. All right, so we need to count how many there are of this one. So this species right here, let's call this species one. So I count one, two, three of species one. I'm gonna keep record up here. Species one, there's three. So this will be number and this will be species. Species one, there's three of them. All right, let's say that this right here is species two. So for species two, I'm counting one, two of them. This will be species three. I count one, two of those. Okay, so species four, this will be this one. I count two of them. And then... I've got this species here, I guess will be species five, and I'm only counting one of those, okay? So we've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
11. Uh-oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. No, I did it right. 10 species. Okay. Five different species, 10 total. Down here, looks like this is species 3, right? And I'm counting for species number 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then this one here was species 2. So for species 2, I'm counting two of those. Once again, 10 total. So now let's do some math. So the diversity index is equal to 1 minus the sum of n over big N squared. So what we have to do is we have to calculate it for each of those and then get the sum of it. All right, so let's start with species 1. So we're going to say 1 minus, so this will be species 1 here. It'll be n, which is the number of that, which is 3, over big N, 10 total, squared. And because this is the sum, we're going to have to add all these together, right? Plus, all right, for species 2, it's 2 is the little n over 10. That's going to be squared. Plus, we're going to go to species 3. There's two of those. So we're going to say 2 over 10 squared again. Let's go to species 4. Species 4, there's 2. Once again, we're getting a theme here. And then species 5, what do we get? There's only 1. So it's 1, 10 squared. So basically, we have to add all these up because remember, we're doing the sum of these. So now let's go ahead. 1 minus... Here's where you're probably going to need your calculator, right? So you could take your handy-dandy calculator, and you could put this in decimals however you want. You could say 3 divided by 10. That is 0.3, and then square it. Just using your handy-dandy calculator. And so I get 0.09 for that. Then 2 over 10, that's 1 fifth squared, which would be, um, so 1 fifth squared would be 1 25th. So you could say 1 divided by 25 is 0.04. And then it looks to me like these are the same, right? Plus 0.04, plus 0.04, plus, and then 1 tenth squared is point, so it would be 1 one hundredth once you squared it. So 1 one hundredth, if you take 1 divided by 100, I'm getting 0.01. So now we just add all these together. So once again, handy dandy calculator, 0.09 plus 0.04 plus 0.04 plus 0.04 plus 0.01. Look in your calculator, see if you got it right. I got 0.2. So now we're going to say 1 minus 0.22. If you do that math, what's that come out to? 0.78 is our diversity index for community A. All right, so we need to do the same thing for community B. Hopefully, it's going to be a little easier. Draw a line. So we're going to say the diversity index is 1 minus the sum of all of these. All right, so let's start. we got species 2 and species 3. So species 2, there are two of them. So we're going to say 1 minus 2 over 10 squared. Plus, for species 3, it looks like there's 8 of them, right? So it's 8 over 10 squared. So we need to calculate that and subtract it all from 1. So 2 over 10 is 1 fifth. 1 25th, we got the same sort of thing that we had up there. We know that that's 0.04. And then plus, 8 divided by 10 is 4 fifths. We can do this either way. 4 divided by 5. And then we got to square that. Here's your calculator, 0.64 here, right? So we've basically got 1 minus 0.68. If you do that, 1 minus 0.68 equals 0.32. 0.32 is the diversity for here. So obviously, if you're comparing, community A has diversity of 0.78, Community B has a diversity of 0.32. Obviously, 0.78 is higher. Community A is more diverse.
So you can easily calculate this Simpson's diversity index using this formula, and this will help you to determine the diversity within a particular community. Okay, so hopefully in this podcast, in this video, you learned about biodiversity, you learned about why it's important that we have diversity in a species, and you learned how to calculate that diversity using the Simpsons Diversity Index.